I'm Emily Harrington. I'm president of the Blanchet House Board of Directors. Thank you for joining me today and for making this event successful. A big thank you to Brian also for bravely sharing uh, that story. It's not easy to do. For those of you that attended the brunch last year, this may look familiar. You may recall that I took this exact position at just about this exact time during our program to execute the uncomfortable and unpopular task of making the ask of each of you. You may also recall my less than proficient public speaking skills. Despite a keen aptitude to deliver an emotional message, I have never truly been able to depart from my pages of notes or make any attempt to pick my head up to meet the sea of curious faces that I know are looking at me right now. <laughs> I feel certain that last year's attendants were extremely kind to me as I clumsily fumbled through this task. Therefore, I decided not to try my good fortune again this year, and instead I thought I would enlist some help. Some of you may know him as the paper boy that never missed your driveway, your neighborhood cat whisperer, the winner of the 2019 Catholic Sentinel's Best Hair Award, or the tall, dark, and handsome guy that could sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman wearing white gloves. <laughs> he also did play a little bit of football with the most impressive pass being the one that he made at me. <laughs> <laughs> it is with pleasure and relief that I bring you my husband, Joey Harrington. I like it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> My name is Joey. I'm married to this beautiful woman here. Two questions I generally get. One, what is it like to be married to a brilliant, hardworking, caring, empathetic woman like Emily? And two, what was it like to play in the NFL? <laughs> I'll start with the latter and hopefully I'll work it back to the former. For 20 years, I played a game that required more partnership than, in my opinion, any other game on earth. 11 people trying to accomplish one goal. And if one of those people is not on the same page as everybody else, if one of those persons decides to go rogue, decides, you know what, I can do this on my own, the whole thing collapses. And most of the time, the quarterback, that was me, ends up face down in the dirt. With rare exception, can one person do it by themselves? In my final stop in the NFL, I played behind a guy named Drew Brees. Many who follow football know who he is. For those who don't, he holds every record in the history of throwing a football, in the history of the NFL, in the history of this world, in the history of everything. <laughs> but what you may not know is Drew is short, he has a noodle for an arm, he's not exceptionally fast, but he will work harder than anybody I ever met. <clears throat> However, in a team game, you can work as hard as you want, but if you don't bring the people around you along for the ride, it's not gonna matter. So what I saw from Drew was something I'd never seen before at any time in my NFL experience. At the end of every practice, he and a receiver named Marcus Colston, when practice was done, when everybody was tired, when the helmets were off, or people were drinking water and trying to get back to the shower and get back to the locker room, they'd go to the corner of the end zone, they'd start to work. And I'd see Drew throw and throw, and I'd see Marcus run and adjust, and I'd see him talk. And we all walked by thinking, well, that's just kind of Drew being Drew. And we stood in the locker room and watched as the receivers who were not part of that drill looked around and said, well, where's Marcus and where's, where's Drew? And the next day when we were leaving the practice field, one of those receivers, hey, can I join as well? And now there's five receivers sitting alone in the, in the locker room. And the next day there's four receivers sitting alone. To the point where the, all the receivers continued to stay out with Drew after practice and the receiver coach was sitting in his position room wondering where the hell everybody is. Well, they're out working with Drew. And it's not just throwing. Because Drew was the best at throwing, but what he understood was that everybody has a different way of getting to the right position. Everybody has a different way of solving the problem. He may have been the smartest person in the room, but he didn't have to be the smartest person in the room. Instead, he encouraged 
his receivers to say, how do you like to get there? And how can I get you the ball in the right position? My last year with the Saints, Drew took his team to the Super Bowl. I got cut, so I didn't get a ring, but you know, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Over Drew's career, he has thrown touchdown passes to 67 different receivers. By comparison, I threw 79 total touchdowns in my career. The power of partnership. Almost 80 years ago, there was a train coming across from the country from New Jersey carrying a, uh, a young man named Dan Christensen heading to the University of Portland to play football. There was a tradition where the current football players would act as greeters for the new players arriving. My grandfather, Bernie Harrington, happened to be the greeter for Dan as he arrived on that train to play football at the University of Portland. The two of them, among other people, would go on to form a social club, which was the beginning of this Blanche house. Concurrently, there was another group of young men, of young men, excuse me, Dan Harrington, Gene Phelps, Jim O'Hanlon, who were leaving Columbia Prep, deciding to join the military, and as the story I've heard goes, went and single-handedly won World War II for the Allies. <laughs> returned home and were asked to join that social club. The social club which admittedly, through their own words, really didn't do much. And I think it was probably because they were still bitter that they weren't granted fraternity status from the university, which is what they wanted to do so that they could meet young women. <laughs> it wasn't until they were introduced to Father Kennard and formed a partnership with him that they truly began this work. Father Kennard challenged them to open the soup kitchen, follow in the steps of Dorothy Day. Out of the back of Father Kennard's car, they served soup, which turned into the building in Northwest Portland, which then turned into the beautiful new facility that is an icon in our city, which now serves over 300,000 meals a year. 300,000 meals from a social club because of the power of partnership. When I made what you call my best pass of my career, and I did not know that she was going to say that until we arrived, <laughs> when I proposed to my beautiful wife 32 years ago, or excuse me, my beautiful <laughs> wife, I saw the number 32, it's coming up. I'm a little disoriented. <laughs> When I proposed to my beautiful wife, I had one of 32 jobs in the world as an NFL quarterback. I thought it was pretty special. I'd twice been on the cover of Sports Illustrated, a 10-story billboard in New York City. It was the third pick of the NFL draft. I thought I had it all figured out. And then, after we got married in 2007, not to 32 years ago, <laughs> I realized I didn't have it all figured out. I learned about selflessness, watching her travel across the country while finishing her master's and holding down a full-time job as a nurse at Providence so that she could wa come watch me play. I thought I understood compassion, but I had a 30,000-foot view of how that worked, and it wasn't until I was educated by a healthcare worker who was boots on the ground that I understood what true compassion was. I learned generosity as I've watched her continuously volunteer for occasion after occasion, even at the detriment to herself and her own schedule so that she can help others. Our partnership has made me a better person. And now, watching you use the power of partnership, we're on the verge of putting together a dream that has been in the back of our minds for a long time, which is opening up a free healthcare clinic to serve the people 
who need it most in this city. And so, it is with that that I would like to bring back the woman who has arguably taught me the most and helped me become the person that I am today. And my mom out there. <laughs> I bring back the first female president of the Blanche Board, my beautiful wife, Emily. All right. It is clear that you can find examples of the power of partnership in any successful organization or championship team. The Blanche is no different. Beginning with our founding fathers, our 68-year legacy is rich with examples of those that collectively answered the call to partner to offer help to those most in need. In continuing to run the theme of the power of partnerships, I am pleased to highlight a partnership with magnanimous impact. The Blanche has partnered with the University of Portland School of Nursing and the Volunteers of America to pilot the first nurse-led primary care clinic to be housed at our downtown facility. These efforts have generously been recognized and supported through a lead gift from the BP Regina Lester John Foundation. I am humbled by the John Foundation's faith in me to fulfill the promise of this clinic. Thank you. And thinking about where the Blanche is today and where it hopes to be going tomorrow, what I know to be true is that there is a progression in the restoration of human dignity. It begins with the basic needs of food, water, and shelter, but it isn't complete without attention given to the physical, spiritual, and mental health needs of an individual. Regardless of our journey, we all want to be seen, to be heard, to be accepted, and to be viewed as worthy, every single one of us. I believe that we must humanize homelessness. It is irresponsible to view the unsheltered population as an object or a thing, a state, or a condition. We are really in big trouble the moment we begin to grow bored or irritated with this problem or to view it as ugly or inconvenient. Last year, I asked you to armor yourselves with compassion and mercy as a defense against becoming jaded. This year, I would ask you all to dream big as to what collectively this room can accomplish. Problems that are seemingly insurmountable need not to be lightened. Rather, broader shoulders should be recruited to take up the load. I know without truly knowing that we have innovators, policymakers, healers, dreamers, and educators in this room. I also know after today that thanks to Blanche, we have a father in this room that is incredibly grateful to have a place in his daughter's lives again. I know that in this room we have souls that are very quietly and intimately wrestling with homelessness, loneliness, addiction, and trauma. These forces spare no one. No one is immune. Most importantly, I know that courageous participation attracts positive things. So I would ask, who's in? Who's going to join me? Who wants to experience the power of a partnership? I will close with a quote that reads, each of us is born with a box of matches inside us, but we can't strike them all by ourselves. Please join me, and with those matches, we will light a candle instead of cursing the darkness. Thank you.